steps of my king. Hello, everyone. Welcome to chapter two of the reading of If My People, the sin of prayerlessness, the sin of prayerlessness. What an incredible uh, topic we've got before us. And I want to start with a quote from Leonard Ravenhill. He said this, revival is when God gets so sick and tired of being misrepresented, misrepresented that he shows up himself. Wow, let's absorb that for a minute. Revival is when God gets so sick and tired of being misrepresented that he shows up himself. And on this topic of revival, that's why it's very interesting because um, there's so many different things. Revival can be weird to some people. Uh, you can have some camp meetings or uh, back then, you know, 1800s or so, even early 1900s, or even now, you know, a series of revival meetings, which aren't bad in and of themselves, but they're more, you know, meetings, get together. Revival is when God encompasses the, 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 his people in a very profound and powerful way where literally the presence and power of God uh, is is very evident. And I liken it to uh, a place uh, like this, let's say lots of electricity all around, right? Just like God is everywhere. You know, we have the electricity uh, that is everywhere, but try putting a knife into the electrical socket. You go from knowing that there is electricity everywhere to actually experiencing the electricity for yourself. So that's what I mean by, and I, I and, and, and I avoid hyper charismatic, uh, teaching and um but i believe the bible teaches that the fire of god for a believer is very good his manifest presence is with us in seasons of revival and so chapter two talks about the sin of prayerlessness again i'll be i'm reading here the from the audiobook if my people at the same time i'm also doing video casting uh so if you're listening to this book on audio you can go to my social media channels and watch the video of it actually. And I'm going to add a lot of commentary. And then conversely, if you're watching the video of me reading this book, you can also download the audio as well. But let me just begin here with chapter two. Um, I must have looked like a deer caught in the headlights when I heard the words, why are we having another prayer and worship night? A few years ago, we offered a night of prayer and worship. And we did that each month. But apparently that was a little bit too much for some individuals, and they made sure to let me know. And I enjoy preaching and listening to sermons, but Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And here's what happens. Those who are not people of prayer, uh, and, and you can have this on both sides. You can have the, the lukewarm side or the truth. You know, it's all about the truth. I just want it preaching. I just want to hear God's word. And both sides can, be, can struggle with the sin of prayerlessness. Because prayer will bring us back to that center of where we need to be. I, I even remember one night the services fl f flowed into each other and a man got upset and he, he told the you know ushers, I came here to hear a sermon. But the power of God was so evident in the services. It was just amazing. I just said, we're just going to continue worshiping. And he didn't like that. And that's a hard issue. Um, and that, that can happen on the legalistic, rigid, hard-hearted side, the critical heart, the negative Nellies, the judgmental Jerry's, and it can also happen on the, the lukewarm side. So we have to, you know, be, be careful of that and repent of that if that has, if that has set in. And, the, you know, the, the, of course, the key verse that we've been using, Second Chronicles 7.14, if my people pray, if my people pray, prayer is the life source to our faith. It's actually the building block of our soul. And um, God's not too busy. He's not on vacation. He's not sleeping. He's an ever-present help in time of need. You can call on him at two in the morning or in the midst of the storm. He hears the prayers of his children. But five-minute devotionals aren't going to cut it in these dire times. Now, I'm all for five-minute devotionals. Encourage your kids to do them. Great thing to add to your schedule. Highly recommend it. But if that's all we are doing, it's like a person consuming 500 calories a day for the rest of their life. Probably not going to work. And so you have, we have to really make prayer a passionate plea of our daily lives and in the morning and in the evening. And, and uh, to call, we must cultivate a life of prayer. And that life of prayer 
is fueled by brokenness and humility so that we become men and women clothed with power from on high. And that comes from broken, humble people petitioning God during seasons of prayer. So you can see how uh, this, the sin of prayerlessness will affect everything. It'll affect your parenting. It'll affect uh, a, a sense of revival in your own home and in your own heart. And we've got to make it a point. You've got to fight the flesh and get back into that position of prayer. And that's why I've dedicated uh, for 23 years now my mornings uh, to prayer, to seeking the heart of God. Obviously, that fluctuates depending on what I'm doing. But, um, you know, the sin of prayerlessness is running rampant in many churches. The dry, dead, le dry, dead, lethargic, I was going to say legalistic, but that's true too, <laughs> legalistic, lethargic condition of the church clearly, clearly reflects an impotent prayer life. That's, you know, you can directly correlate prayer and brokenness and humility with a, a powerful church, a powerful church service, a, so a group of solid believers. And when we get away from that uh, that element of prayer in our life, that's when we become stagnant and and dead and cold and formal uh, when it comes to spiritual matters. Matters. So prayerlessness in the pew leads to shattered lives and depression. Prayerlessness in men leads to the breakdown of the family. Prayerlessness in Washington leads to the breakdown of society. And as Ian Bounds stated, when faith ceases to pray, it ceases to live. I'm going to say that again. This is so important. When your faith ceases to pray, you will cease to live, spiritually speaking. You'll, a spiritual apathy will set in. And I want to recommend here uh, a book by uh, E.M. Bounds. Uh, actually, I would encourage you to, it's called The Best of E.M. Bounds. And it will really, you know, get your prayer life going in the right direction. Of course, looking to the Word of God is primary. The next section, when the church had power, is America's future hopeless the Bible is clear that God judges wickedness and reprimands his people when they are falling short or they are drifting away from him. And many of the Old Testament prophets experience hardship and exile as a result of God reprimanding his people. In short, he disciplines us because he loves us and it, and it, and it should spark repentance. And then he judges the wickedness because they don't repent of their sins. So repentance is so key in this area. Many are divided because although we realize America is right for judgment uh, for the atrocities and, you know, that ranges everything, the range is huge, you know, aborting babies to redefining truth and look at the sexual perversion that is running rampant and men dressing as provocative women and, and so it's just, it is, it's alarming and that's where the word perversion comes from. It's perverting of God's truth and oh, the stench, how it has reached the nostrils of God and um, and we see that a lot of Christians are not seeking God with all their heart. And many examples can be found in the Old Testament of God staying his hand of judgment when righteous people contend and plead for revival and mercy. And that really is my hope for America. That's the whole point of putting out this audiobook and the print book, of course, and, and the ebook is to fuel the, 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 the flames of revival through prayer and brokenness and humility. And God doesn't want us to sit back, relax, and wait for Jesus' return, as some think he does. We must expose the unfruitful works of darkness and fight demonic opposition. But to do that, we need spiritual power. Duncan Campbell, in his book, The Price and Power of Revival, makes a very compelling point. He said, how is that while we make great Satan, we make such great claims for the power of the gospel. We see so little of the supernatural in operation. Man, that is profound. We make such great claims for the power of the gospel, and rightly so. But why do we see such, uh, such minimal results or very little of the supernatural in operation? Is there any reason why the church today cannot everywhere equal the church at Pentecost? No, there's no reason why. We are as revived as we want to be. Okay, let me say that again. We are as revived as you want to be. Your relationship with God is as deep as you want it to be. You're seeking God to the degree you want to seek him. And so this is profoundly important. And Duncan Campbell uh, experienced the New Hebrides revivals uh, that were so critical and key um, in reviving that area of New Hebrides. And we believe in the fullness and the power of the Spirit. We do. And so do many of you, I know. But we truly 
don't experience it to the degree I think we can. Most of the churches need to be revived beginning with prayer. And that's, again, I think it's about six years ago now in December, we started a morning prayer and worship service. So the doors open at 6 a.m. The churches, many people come uh, just for that worship service. We have worship on, and then we go into a time of prayer, and then obviously start our services. And, and that has to become the focal point of, of the church. The prayer service really, um, you know, a lot of churches don't have it. And I know it's hard. I mean, getting people to pray is like pulling teeth. The reason is it's so important and, and the flesh fights it probably more than anything else. Uh, it fights against living holy, against fasting, against prayer, against seeking God. It, it's The flesh does not want to do that. It's the enmity within us that is driving us away from the prayer closet. That's why we have to be uh, disciplined. We have to persevere, fortitude, strength, all these biblical terms to press into the prayer closet. And Jesus said, go into that closet and God will reward you. Um, but Corporate and national revival that we are talking about begins as individual men and women and young adults humbly and through brokenness seek the heart of God. And they do that through prayer and fasting. And uh, here's just one example of a powerful move of God, again, from Duncan Campbell. He said this, I think again of those people in the Hebrides, how they longed and how they prayed and how they waited and how they cried. Oh God, rend the heavens and come down. And all the time, God was working behind the scenes. All the time, God was dealing with them. And in the process of cleansing, uh, God went on to, to really work deep in their hearts. Until that moment came when angels and archangels looking over the battlements of glory cried, God, the vessels are clean. The miracle can happen now. Oh, just think of that. The, the angels looking down and the vessels are clean. The bride is ready. The people are hungry. They're hungering and thirsting for righteousness. I believe that with all my heart, it is the deep conviction of my soul that they are ever gazing over the battlements of glory and waiting for a prepared people. And a lot of times people get out of this, you know, whole concept of revival by saying, you know, you can't really work it up. It's it's God's sovereignty, which is true. You know, I'm, I'm not really a fan of everything Charles Finney said in lectures on revival, thinking, you know, you can have revival whenever you want it, as long as you do the right things. You know, there's there's sovereignty comes into play there for sure. However, there's a lot of truth in that, that if you till the soil, uh, God will bring the rain. And that's often throughout the Bible. I can think of Joel, possibly Amos, the Psalms. Um, some other prophetic books where rain, uh, Elijah for sure, Elaine, rain was a sign of refreshment and revival and renewal. And like Elijah heard the sound of rain, he had faith. He was he was a prepared vessel. And I don't think it's it's um, an accident that he called out the prophets of Baal uh, during that time and during that season. And the fire came down on Mount, Mount Carmel and. and consume the entire sacrifice and the prophets of Baal were mocked and ridiculed. And he said, why, why are you wavering between two opinions? People follow God. And then after that, the rain, the blessing of God came. And I, I think there's an incredible principle there. Back to the book. Now news headlines often read churches are closing and Christianity is on the decline. But the truth is that Jesus's church is stronger than ever throughout the world. He is building his church and the gates of hell cannot prevail. Check out Matthew 16, 18. But it does beg the question, why does the church as a whole appear so impotent? Well, Leonard Ravenhill made a powerful quote here, and it's worth repeating. I think I did it in the other uh, chapter. Since something is obviously stopping the Spirit's inflow to us Christians, so what, what, do some self-examination here. What is stopping your inflow? The same thing is stopping His outflow from us. With the Spirit's help, we need to search for this hindrance. And notice, He does not say, with the law's help. Uh, it's because the letter kills the, and the Spirit gives life. So yes, we need the Word of God to enlighten and encourage it and, and reprimand and convict and renew our mind. But ultimately, we need to ask the Spirit of God, Lord, show me what is wrong in my own heart. And the law can lead to pride, uh, the Bible thumping. Uh, and I see a lot of people. And the reason I say this is because obviously those who are lukewarm, you know, not following God very fervent, fervently, obviously we know 
That's why they're not experiencing a massive downpour of God's spirit into their own heart. But sometimes we forget about this other side, the proud, legalistic. And I saw this. I can't tell you how many times I saw this in my in my own church uh, over the years where it's it's often the legalistic, you know, arrogant, critical, just tearing apart just about everything, things that aren't really essential. And they just, the reason is they have a critical heart. They're prideful and they like to show their knowledge. And it's often, often, this is amazing. I rare, I never see these people at prayer meetings. I don't see them at the altar crying out to God, worshiping. Uh, they say that's too emotional. No, it's really their excuse to hide their spiritual apathy. And so that's why I make statements like this is reminding people the law the book, the word, just the word alone, knowledge puffs up and it leads to pride. And we have um, covered before how that can block the channels of God's blessing in our lives because God will not share his glory with another. Even people as worthy as ourselves, that's a sarcastic statement, of course. Um, there's only one person worthy, that being Christ. And so back to, to clarify this point, um, God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. So maybe some of you listening, some of you watching this, you need to humble yourself. You're, you are a judgmental Jerry. You're a critical Kathy. Uh, you don't have the fire of God. You don't have the love of God. Think about it. Think about the, the fruit of the spirit. Just right off the bat, love, joy, peace, contentment, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness. That's not the mark of modern-day Pharisees. That's not the mark of, of just mean-spirited, angry Christians. Some of them are not even saved, so that's a problem. Um, they've got head knowledge, but heart knowledge, but other times. And like I've been there, I mean, maybe some of you, I've talked about this. I've opened up about this in 2005 and other seasons in my life where I, I drift, you know, you get legalistic and kind of hard and rigid and use the word of God against people and, you know, and, and, and rule your home with a rod of iron and not too much grace and not too much mercy. It's, it's that often is happening because you're dying spiritually. And uh, that apathy, that spiritual apathy is affecting, you know, all areas of life. But be encouraged. You can change that today. You can change that, that today uh, and just cry out to God and say, Lord, I repent. I need the fire of the spirit. I need what, uh, what Shane is talking about here. Proud people lack humility and passionate prayer. Um, it's hard desire. It's hard to desire something you don't think you need. Now, let me say that again. Proud people, they lack humility and passion passionate prayer because they don't think they need that. They're resting on their Bible knowledge. They, they forget that it's really about heart engagement, emotional worship, powerful prayer along with God's word. That's a fourfold strand that is not easily broken. They have the letter of the law, but not the heart of Christ. Good theology, but hard hearts. Sadly, those in this camp don't think that revival is biblical or they'll make excuses because they are proud and teachable and eager to dispute like the church in Ephesus they must see their need Jesus said I hold this against you you have forsaken the love you had at first consider how far you have fallen repent and do the things you did at first revelation chapter 2 verses 4 through 5 the lukewarm church on the other hand disdains the heat of conviction thus it remains lukewarm so see here's that's the problem this group is, is convicted, you know, by the word of God so much so that they become legalistic and mean spirited and um, judgmental and, you know, a, a, a whole bunch of standards that they put on other people and follow them around for a week. And you'll see that they themselves do not follow up to most of these. But then you have the lukewarm church and they don't even like conviction. Uh, they don't like the heat of God's word. Therefore, they remain lukewarm. And when I consider the lukewarm church, I'm often reminded of a book by Wilbur Rees. Wilbur Rees, R-E-E-S, this is incredible. He said this, I would like to buy $3 worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep, but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk or a snooze in the sunshine. And Rees continues, I want ecstasy, not transformation. I want the warmth of the womb, but not a new birth. I want a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. I would like to buy just $3 worth of God, please. Wow. This is, this is sad, but it's very characteristic of many people today. They honestly don't want 
to fully surrender their lives and receive the full fire of God's power and presence. Both groups, the proud and the lukewarm, must come to full repentance and total abandonment of their former ways. The Holy Spirit, always watching for a believer's deep repentance, repentance moves quickly quickly to restore rebuild that person's life that's what i love about god right now right now as you're listening you can cry out to god you can pray you can repent you can say lord forgive me i'm coming back to you right now you don't have to wait six months you don't have to put in your application and see if they call you you don't have to follow a checklist and go through some training right now the power of god can come upon you if you repent and fully surrender your life it's amazing as a result of the holy spirit coming See, that's another thing I should probably talk about briefly. The Holy Spirit is alongside of, of people. We know that. You know, it, it, so we're paraclete, uh, parakletos, I believe, in the Greek, where it's alongside, like a helper. But then the Holy Spirit is in you. Uh, the preposition there is um, E-N. It, 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 he's, he's in you. And you're, 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 you can quench and grieve the Spirit. You can um, submit to the work of the Spirit. And you're sealed with the Spirit. The Spirit, your, Spirit is given to you as a guarantee. But then there's something remarkable. Uh, it's called epi. And you'll see that in the Bible. And the Spirit came upon Peter. The Spirit came upon Jesus. The Spirit came upon. It's this E-P-I. It's, a, it's different than in. Um, because I can have water. I don't have any examples here. But I can have water. Let's say many of you know of a big sparklets bottle, right? Five gallons. You can have water. Okay, look. Now, water is in that sparklets bottle okay it's in it we can see it maybe it's down low or in the middle who knows but it's in it it's not i mean it's it's not affecting anything around it you know let's say there's a computer next to it a laptop next to it uh, an iphone next to it okay nothing no big deal right now but when this word epi is used it is the more water going in more water going into this sparklets bottle and as this more water goes in, the water comes out and it actually flows out of overwhelmed by uh, upon the bottle. The, the, the water's upon the bottle. It's, it's, it's running down. It's affecting everything on the desk, the, the recorder, the, the phone, the computer. Everything is now affected and influenced by this incredible overflowing of the water. So see, there's a big difference between the water in the sparklets bottle and the water overflowing out of the sparklets bottle. And that's what many people are missing. Many Christians have about this much water. And uh, we, full surrender, you get some more. Surrender this area, you get some more. And again, it's not works-based. And I, 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 want, I want people to realize they have all of the Sp Holy Spirit at conversion. You know, you have all of the Holy Spirit at conversion, but does he have all of you? In other words, you have, how much do you want him to keep putting in? It, it, it is directly related to obedience to the word of God, holiness, filled with the spirit of God, a life of prayer, a life of passionate worship. And, and that's how the Holy Spirit comes upon a believer. It's, it's amazing. So anyway, back here to the book. Um, as a result of being filled, you will be uh, passionate for prayer. You'll have a humble spirit and there will be a desire in your heart to share the grace and kindness of the Lord with others through your words and through your works. And again, personal confession, this is hard for me as a pastor. I'm putting a book on audio. We've got these video casts going on. I don't read this and go, boy, I'm sure glad I mastered this, this a few years ago. I mean, I could be doing great th today and then later today, yeah, not too great. So. Lord, help me. I need to repent and I need to season my words with grace and love and mercy because you're constantly fighting the flesh. So be encouraged. Uh, next section here, sustaining the flame, sustaining the flame. What is that word? Um, probably just got about 10 minutes here and then we'll close up this chapter. Sustaining the flame. You know, if you build a fire, you got to keep it going. So repentance clearly sparks a flame of revival and spiritual renewal, but prayer and fasting continue to keep the fire fueled. What starts revival also re maintains revival, whether it's corporately in the church, nationally in your, in our in our country, our country, community, our county, or in your own personal lives. What started that fire, you've got to is, is going to is going to keep. Uh, you're going to need to keep doing that to maintain that fire. Same thing happens in studying revivals. You know, throughout throughout history, I love studying revivals. Um, 
that initial spark has to be maintained. The prayer, the brokenness, um, the, the desperation, crying out to God and, you know, different things that, that are happening. And when we deal seriously with our sin, the sin of apathy, God will deal seriously with us and our prayers will begin to reflect his will. Then, then he will take great joy and, 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 and begin to just baptize us in, his, in, in love and joy and peace because we have obedience, we're, we're praying and we need to be revived. We need to be revived because there is spiritual power via prayer in these dire times. I remember, how about you? I remember when the church sought God in an upper room for days until the fire fell. I remember when we were not in a hurry and extended worship services drove us to our knees. I remember when we prayed for people and they were healed. I remember when people were excited about seeking God rather than making excuses why they can't go to church. I remember when we took authority over the demonic realm and saw God conquering uh, sinners and, and reviving them and, and setting them up on the right path. And I believe we can have that again. Never forget that the weakest saint on their knees makes Satan tremble. Again, the weakest saint, the weakest saint, no matter how weak you think you are, when you're on your knees praying, it makes Satan tremble. Many sing the famous lyrics, this is how I fight my battles. But at some point we have to fight and not just sing. Prayer and fasting are the primary weapons of spiritual warfare. And just in case you're joining us a little late, the reason I mention fasting often with prayer is I see it as a biblical model for sure. Jesus said, when you fast, not if you fast, the disciples fasted, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, uh, David, uh, the psalmist, um, Peter and Paul and, you know, and, and early church. And you can read the writings of um, Ignatius and Polycarp. Uh, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, I may have already said that, Ignatius, uh, of course, Augustine and the Didache or the Didacte, the early church writings. On, I mean, the reason is, <clears throat> I'm even, in, if, you know, as I record this, I'm, I, I, I've, I'm often in a fasted state because you, you deny that fleshly appetite. And I say, Lord, I want to exchange that for an appetite for you. Number one. Number two is, I believe there's, it, it, your physical affects the spiritual. How you take care of your body physically affects the spiritual. So when we eat, especially a large amount, you know, 50% of our body's energy is used to digest that food. So now I don't feel like praying. Now I'm apathetic. I mean, think of trying to pray after a big dinner. It just doesn't work. And so that's why fasting, I believe, is so important. Prayer and fasting are just incredible weapons against spiritual warfare. Uh, and I've taught on that. You can watch, you know, you can search it on my social media outlets for that, that, that topic of fasting. I've written books on fasting. So I'm not going to go into a lot of that now. My, my goal right now is just to spark that hunger for fasting. Uh, in these dire times right now, in these dire situations, repentance, fasting with the right attitude, the right heart, and prayer are always prescribed. I think of Joel. I don't know if I'll, I'll come, come to – oh, yeah, I did later on here. Now, now I'm looking down. But first, I think of Isaiah 58.1. It uh, reminds pastors and, and leaders to shout with the voice of a trumpet blast – and we must confront spiritual apathy to change it. We must confront sin to spark revival. And in the book of Joel, God's blessings were fading and the people faced enormous devastation. Sound familiar? Hello? God, it's the same wake-up call, folks. The wake-up call of God has not changed. The prophet didn't say, well, sit at home and complain, post some memes, do some tweets, do some Instagram, do some TikTok videos. He said, consecrate a fast. In other words, set aside time to fast. Call a sacred assembly, call, call people together, gather the elders, elders need to lead by example, and the habitant and, and the people, and go into the house of your Lord and cry out to God. And when all hope is gone, God is not gone. Cry out to him. It's interesting. He even goes on to say, let the priest come before the porch and the altar and let the priest, let the pastors lead with brokenness and humility. And Joel reminds us that fasting is a priority from the greatest to the least among us. We also see the importance of desperation. The desperate are truly hungry for God. So be encouraged. Moses received the word of God when he fasted. King Jehoshaphat experienced victory. Esther received protection. Elijah was restored and renewed. Daniel experienced the supernatural. Ezra received direction and safe passage. Nehemiah was strengthened. Joel offered the cure for judgment, which was fasting. Jesus was empowered by his fast. And on and on it goes. Many prayers in the Bible were answered when full stomachs were replaced with full hearts. 
Fasting is spiritual warfare. Even though you might lose a battle, you don't have to lose the entire war. So get up and keep fighting and keep fasting and keep praying. When you combine prayer, real prayer, where it becomes a daily priority with fasting and worship and obeying God's word and looking to God's word every day, you gain tremendous spiritual muscle. This is why the enemy hates these spiritual disciplines. He knows that prayer is the great sin killer. Prayer is the fear quencher. Fear, I'm sorry, prayer is the power bringer. Fear is the victory giver. It's the holiness promoter. It's the lust eliminator. It's the obstacle remover. It's the time changer. It's the life sustainer. It's the demon slayer. It's the wisdom giver. It's the peace elevator. It's the depression lifter. It's the it's the anxiety demolisher. It's the anger suppressor. It's the weakness remover. It's the strength booster. And prayer is a revival stimulator. Anything negative is counterbalanced during times of prayer. When the church prays, it has power. When you pray, you have spiritual power. Revival is a gift from God. God cares about the spiritually dead enough to wake them up up. How do you wake up those who are spiritually dead? You sound the alarm, you sound the trumpet, you confront. And that's what's happening in a lot of churches in America. We are not confronting. We are capitulating and we're, um, we're singing rockabye, baby, instead of wake up, move it forward, get your hearts right, repent before God. And the third element that the Lord commanded through Joel, the prophet, was the gathering together of the people to worship. This, this time of, of prayer was amplified in the presence of other brothers and sister, sisters kneeling beside us, lifting up one another before the Lord and crying out for revival with the unified voice. And again, this is why fasting is so important. Can you imagine all got, coming together after a big dinner? And, uh, you know, we, we have tons of potlucks and get togethers and food is everywhere, but there needs to be seasons where King's stomach is dethroned and we begin to seek God, God and we, we as that hunger comes up, we begin to pray like never before. And this is why the enemy has been attacking, uh, especially with the pandemic. When I wrote this book in 2020 or so, um, seeking he was seeking to prevent God's people from calling a solemn, assemb a solemn assembly and gathering together to cry out to the Lord. Matthew 18 is an often repeated verse, usually out of context, but it is powerful. It is a reminder of the of the importance of gathering together the saints. It's when Jesus said, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where there are two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in the midst of him. I mean, that's powerful. If you believe the Bible is what it says it is, and I do, that's powerful. Why do you think Satan is trying to keep you busy? Why do you think Satan is trying to keep you busy and full? Because when I'm busy, I don't have time for God. When I'm full, my spiritual hunger for God is it declines at a very, very significant rate. Why do you think God is trying to draw you? I'm sorry. Why do you think the enemy is trying to draw you back into sin and addiction? Why do you think the enemy wants you to stay bitter, angry, and critical? To rob you of spiritual power. He is here to steal kill and destroy, as John 10.10 10 says. We must change that. We must cry out like the saints of the past and say, oh God, would you rend the heavens and come down? We must return to the prayer closet and return to being hunger, hungry and thirsty for God. That's a very good thing. Now be encouraged because Isaiah 58 offers incredible hope. Although the context supports Israel returning to God, the principle still applies to us today. Then your light will shine out from the darkness. Now, many people you know, say this is what fasting will do to you uh, in a good way. And and there's there's truth to that. But Isaiah 58 in context is really God dealing with the hearts of the people. He's saying you fast, but still you're critical, you're mean, you're negative, you're angry. This is the fast that I chosen that you um, that you release those, 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 those bonds of wickedness and being critical and oppressing your neighbor, then your light will break through. So it's not necessarily saying fasting will cause your light to break through, which it will. It's getting your heart right and then combined it with prayer and fasting. That's where the power really comes from. Then your light will shine out from the darkness and the darkness around you will be as bright as noon. The Lord will guide you continually, giving you water when you're dry and restoring your strength. You'll be like a well-watered garden, like an ever-flowing spring. Some of you will repent 
rebuild the deserted ruins of your cities. Then you'll be known as rebuilders of the wall and a restorer of homes, which is Isaiah 58, 10 through 12. I actually chose to use a commentary on this one, the New Living Translation. I encourage uh, thought for um, word for word, which is uh, formal equivalence, where these, what I just read is more of a dynamic equivalence. They're good for devotional and stuff, but you know, stick with a good study Bible. Now, are you ready to restore your home in, your, in our nation? Here's my call to you. Now, we might not restore our nation. It might be going to hell in a handbasket, um, but at least there'll be seasons of revival during this difficulty. At least when darkness rises up, the light will shine. And, uh, but I believe we can have personal revival in our homes and in our churches. And then from that, it will go out and affect the nation. And remember, I'm here in Los Angeles County in California. And I believe this with all my heart because God often takes the least likely in times of darkness when it looks like revival is least likely because things are so bad. He takes that too. That combination is powerful. He finds men and women on their face crying out to him, praying. He will revive those people that in return can revive a section of the church, a section of the state. And can, those flames of, of revival can go into our, to our entire nation or at least into your homes, into the hearts of your children. So are you re ready to restore personal revival in your heart? Again, the good news is that you can begin today. Did you hear that? The good news is that you, be, you can begin today, no matter how far you have fallen. Set your sights on God and he will see you through. Let me repeat that again. No matter how far you have fallen, no matter how far you have drifted, it doesn't matter at this point. Set your sights on God, set your focus on God, fall forward into his arms of forgiveness and redemption rather than falling backward away from him and into the enemy's camp. Do that today and the results will be amazing. God will get you back on track. Doesn't mean there won't be consequences uh, to our actions, but you will be experiencing the joy of the Lord because you know now you're on the right path. And that, that brings tremendous peace and comfort and joy.